us. We're grateful for who you are and everything you are to us. Lord, we lift you up tonight, Lord. We come before your throne, giving you thanksgiving. Lord, praising your holy name. Lord, lifting your righteous name up. Lord, we lift, Lord, our children up this school year, Lord, that you would continue to bless them and protect them and educate them in a, in a healthy environment, Lord. Lord, we pray tonight, Lord, that your loving arms would wrap around them and our teachers, that you would give them wisdom, Lord, for each and every kid. We pray over Harold tonight, Lord, Harold Taylor, you know, Lord, the healing recovery he's got up ahead with breaking his hip. And we're asking you to do a good work in him, a speedy recovery, Lord. We're asking, Lord, to touch Chris Whitmer tonight to dry out this pneumonia, Lord, to bring healing to her body. Lord, give her peace, Lord. Touch Brian as well. Lord, wrap that family around, Lord, with your spirit and your loving arms. We lift up Harold Pruitt tonight, Lord, that you would... Step into his heart situation, Lord, and let it regulate the way it should and bring healing where it needs to be brought, Lord. Lord, we speak, Lord, peace to Brother Reed tonight and all the stings that he had endured, that, Lord, you would just take care of all this problem, Lord. Bring him healing, take away the pain, take away any swelling, any side effects he has. Lord, we ask you to be with us tonight as we go over your word. We pray blessing over your people. In your wonderful name we pray. Amen. In your wonderful name of Jesus, amen, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Tonight, we're continuing series three called The Spirit in Our Lives, and we're specifically on 3.3, titled He Comes Bearing Gifts. Sounds like a nice lesson to talk about. Who doesn't like some good gifts? 1 Corinthians 12, 31 says, But covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. So we're going to talk tonight about how the spiritual gifts that God gives are given to the church to benefit and uplift the church. And as individuals, we should be trying to pursue and seek out spiritual gifts so we can therefore benefit the church and uplift the church. In our lesson connection, I don't know if any of you do have those or not, but it does share a story about two brothers-in-law, Roy and Larry. Roy lived in Minnesota. Larry lived in Illinois. And one day, Roy received a pair of moleskin trousers from his mother. He got a gift. And Roy didn't like them because they froze in the wintertime so stiff and so... Roy doesn't like this gift he had been given, so he gives them to Larry. And Larry decides that he's going to wear them a few times, but Larry didn't like them either. So he wrapped them back up and gave them to Roy the following Christmas, which started this regifting exchange between the both of them. And then Roy then returned the favor one year later by returning the trousers back to Larry, and things remained fairly peaceful for quite a few years, but then one year, Roy had the pants mechanically twisted so tight that they fit inside of a three-foot-long and one-inch-wide tube before he gave them back to Larry. And then so began the contest. For practically 25 years, the brothers-in-laws, they thought up more and more creative ways to regift the pants that would compel the other person just to hold on and keep them. But one year, Larry compressed them into a seven-inch cube wrapped with wire like belled hay. And then Roy, he goes on and puts them in a two-foot crate filled with stones that was nailed shut and banded together with steel. And then Larry, he then had the slacks mounted inside an insulated window with a 20-year warranty. Roy then stuffed them into a five-inch coffee can that was soldered shut. The can was then placed into a five-gallon container filled with concrete and reinforcing rods. Larry, in return, secured the pants in a 225-pound homemade steel ashtray etched with Roy's name on the side of it. Roy then purchased a 600-pound safe, took it to the branch of Larry's company to have it decorated in red and green stripes and welded shut with the pants inside. 
In that last report, Larry went big by shipping the pants back to Roy inside of a green three-foot cube that was previously in 1974 Gremlin automobile with 95,000 miles on it before being compressed by a car crusher at a junkyard. And a note was attached explaining that the pants were inside the glove compartment. So they went back and forth until finally in 1989, the pants were accidentally burned up when molten glass was poured over them. And so Roy then swept up the ashes, placed them in an urn, and returned, returned them to Larry with a note that read, Sorry, old man, here lies the pants. <laughs> in an attempt to cast the pants in glass, brought about the demise of their gifting exchange. With that, the pants in the 25-year-long tradition was done. They have had quite a run at it, and these guys went to the extreme to outdo each other with the most creative and interesting ways to re-gift their present that neither of them wanted in the first place. And when we turn our attention toward God, we see what an amazing gift giver he is. And he's not only an amazing gift giver, but he gives us wonderful gifts. It's not only the quantity, it's also the quality. He gives us gifts to be desired, not some own thing that we don't have anymore, we never wanted to begin with. It may not be much of a gift if we don't actually want it. And we know the receiver of that gift doesn't want it either. You know, people normally enjoy thoughtful gifts, gifts that have some sort of value attached to it, whether it be sentimental or financial. You could fill in the blank, whatever you would personally like to enjoy. But tonight we're mainly talking about spiritual gifts that are of incredible value to ourselves and or those around us. The spiritual gifts that God gives us are so uniquely matched to us personally. He's not just giving us some leftover, dusty old item with no value, but I'm thankful that our God gives his children good gifts that they can hold on to. God is a good gift getter, giver. He's already given us the gift of life, and he wants to give humanity the gift of the Holy Ghost. And he wants to give his children spiritual gifts. By the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, Paul listed the gifts of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12. And I'm going to do a little reading here, starting at verse 1, going through verse 11. It says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Ye know that ye were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols, even as ye were led. Wherefore, I give to you, I give to, you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed. And that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. Now there are differences of ministrations about the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations. But it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. To another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another, the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, diverse kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and the self same Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. So God gives us these good gifts for the church. And God has promised to place, select gifts in its members to best serve his kingdom's purpose. These gifts are beautifully crafted and designed to equip the church for God's mission. How many know as the church that we have a mission? We have a mission to accomplish. And God's not sending us out on the battlefield empty-handed. He wants to equip us. The gifts that God gives us are perfectly chosen. They're perfectly distri distributed. And we know that God is omnipresent, meaning he's everywhere. We also know that God is omniscient, referring to that God knows everything. He has full knowledge. The Lord is all-powerful, 
And through the gifts of the Spirit, we can see the God who is everywhere make himself known by giving us knowledge and power to edify the church. We therefore become his hands and his feet. The supernatural gifts that we're talking about in 1 Corinthians 12 is for times of need. Because within the church, the supernatural gifts should be normal, not abnormal. We should be very familiar with the supernatural gifts. This should not be something that we're shocked by, and they should be expected. We should be expecting the supernatural gifts to be working within the church service. They should not be something unexpected. If you've been in the church for a while and you haven't experienced the supernatural gifts of the Spirit, and you're shocked, well, we might need to seek the Lord about that. We want to get engaged. We want to get plugged in. But we've got to understand that these gifts are not listed in any specific order of importance or in any way places one gift above another. Different gifts, but no order of hierarchy indicating that there's some sort of ranking within the gifts that some gifts are better than the other. Therefore, some person thinking they have the gift is boasting over here that they got something better. Not the case at all. If that's in your head, you need to clear that out right away. That's not the case. These are to uplift the church and given to the church, not to uplift any one person. And these gifts, spiritually speaking, tend to fall into three categories. Even though there is no ranking or hierarchy, they do seem to fall into three different categories, which we're going to talk about. Revelation gifts, power gifts, and vocal gifts. And these three names kind of give a good description of the nature of each type of of gift. For instance, the revelation gifts. They involve the working of the Spirit to divinely reveal to a Christian something that would be otherwise unknown or unknowable. The writers in Hebrews declared in Hebrews 14, saying, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. The revelation gifts allow God to impart a piece of knowledge that to us would be unknown. Knowledge to us for the good of the church. First, we're going to talk about the word of knowledge. God shares with a Christian a fact or some sort of knowledge about a person. This may seem bullet pointed tonight as we talk about the different gifts, but it's important that we get a good foundation laid so we can have a good understanding and then we can build upon that. So the word of knowledge gives a Christian a fact or some sort of knowledge about a person, a circumstance, something that has happened or something that will happen in the future. A word of knowledge could be God providing a believer with information about someone's past so that that person could be ministered to more effectively. They could be made aware of some internal condition that they have that they have not dealt with. Maybe they were unaware that they had been dealing with this under the surface this whole time but it becomes out of the it comes out of the darkness and it became it becomes made manifest into the light it could be some occurrence some knowledge that's given to a person so they can avoid hurt or pain and so on and so on you can fill in the blank with the endless possibilities that this could be but has there ever been a time when God allowed you to know something about which you otherwise would have been completely unaware without the God, God's knowledge stepping in into your situation. Sometimes God gives us the word of knowledge, and we're thankful for it. We should be thankful for his gifts. When we talk about the next gift, the word of wisdom, and when we talk about wisdom, we're talking about a supernatural gift of wisdom, because we've got to make a little distinction here, because not... We're not talking about wisdom in the human realm where someone may not have a relationship with God and could still act wisely. For instance, a criminal may make wise preparations in committing their crime, but that does not mean they're wise. That's that's in being foolish. And so when we talk about, like an atheist can make wise career choices, but it doesn't mean that's a sense of the human nature of wisdom. We're talking about the gift of wisdom that God imparts supernaturally for a specific purpose for a specific time. 
And while a word of knowledge is informational, where we receive some sort of knowledge, a word of wisdom is directional. So it goes beyond just giving facts. The word of wisdom gives insights. It gives direction in how to proceed moving forward in a particular situation. It gives us understanding on how we are to take our next step. It gives us clarity on things otherwise not known. It will give us understanding, and it gives us the will of God and allows us to know how and what God wants us to do in order to move forward. You know, it's a good thing if you don't know what you're supposed to do. Ask God who gives liberally. Say, Lord, I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what to do. Please show me the way forward. That's a great prayer to pray. Lord, show me the path forward. Show me the best path forward. Show me your path, your perfect path for my life forward. And you think, well, you can look at that long term as in your whole entire life, which would be fantastic, but maybe it's just for the day. Lord, show me the path forward and get through this conversation because I don't know how to get out of it. But whatever it could be, go ahead and ask God. You're always going to be blessed. And with the word of wisdom, a person is divinely directed to the appropriate steps that they should take. They have clarity. They have understanding now. They know what they need to do and move forward. You know, one day Solomon was approached by two mothers and one baby. One woman said, this woman's son died in the night and she switched her dead baby for my live one. The other woman said, no, the living son is mine and the dead one is yours. How could Solomon tell which woman was the actual mom? What a predicament to be in if you're a judge. You know what I'm saying? Like, you want the easy cases. This one's a little difficult. They didn't have DNA testing kits back then. And the king said, bring me a sword and divide the living child into two and give half to the one mother and half to the other. And the mother of the actual baby said, oh, no, Lord, please don't do that. Do not kill the child. Give the baby to the other woman. And the other woman said, no, let them be divided. Let us neither get the baby, but go ahead and kill the baby. And Solomon said, give the child to the first woman. She's the mom. How could Solomon possibly know what to do in that situation? Now, we read the end of the story now, so it's pretty easy for us to guess the end result. But, you know, this wasn't, there was never a case like this beforehand. But essentially, God was providing the wisdom for Solomon to know what to do. So since God's got all wisdom and knowledge, you know, a lot of people like to read self-help books, and they're phenomenal, wonderful, I love them. But, you know, the highest point of knowledge and understanding is God. So go straight to the source. Always go to the source when you need something. But likewise, just as God gave Solomon and he shared wisdom with him, God gives us believers wisdom, and he gives us the word of wisdom in order to provide us with a sense of direction and how to move forward. The final revelation gift is discerning of spirits. It is defined as the supernatural gift of perceiving the spiritual motivations for an action or what type of spirit is at work in any given situation. So this gift helps us to know whether someone is being influenced by God, whether they're being influenced by the devil, whether they're being influenced by the world or maybe their own flesh. There can be a lot of things at play when determining or dealing with why someone is behaving a certain way. You ever wonder why some people just behave a certain way? Like, what is the deal? Is that them? Is that their makeup? Or is this something extra going on here? Discerning the spirits helps with that. It cuts right through the clutter. gets right to the heart of the matter. You know, an unfamiliar man came to the altar during a service in Mississippi, and he was thrashing. He was kicking. And the men in the church thought he was demon-possessed, so they loaded up their spiritual six-shooters, and they gathered around him and rebuked and cast out every devil they could think of, and nothing changed. So then the pastor walked over to the man, spoke something into his ear, and the stranger got up, and he walked out. So everyone wanted to know what the pastor said, because whatever we were doing clearly wasn't working, and he just spoke something, and that guy leaves, so we want to know what's up. 
Were they mispronouncing Jesus' name right, or did they not have enough faith? But it wasn't that at all. The pastor just whispered, if you don't stop acting like that, I'm going to call the police. Because God gave him the gift of discerning of spirits to let him know that it wasn't the devil at all. This man was acting out in his own flesh, trying to make a scene and cause a ruckus in front of everybody. Why it's important that we have the discerning of the spirit in operation working in our church. You could be trying to cast out a, de a demon and there's no demon there. They may, they may have been influenced by one to move over there, but... When we switch to the power of gifts, we know God's all-powerful. There's nothing he cannot do. His power doesn't have any scale to measure his capabilities. He has the capacity to do anything he pleases. And his spirit that dwells inside of each of his believers places that same power in each of us. Ephesians 3.30 says, Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. First off of the power gift is the gift of faith. Now, this one's important because every believer has been given a measure of faith. Roman 12 tells us, but the gift of faith goes beyond initial belief in God. Because the Bible speaks of faith in one sense as the fruit of the Spirit. Everyone needs a measure of faith. In this sense, though, faith would be trusting and believing in God. Faith in this context would be necessary for every believer. At the same time, we have this where it speaks of faith as the fruit of the Spirit. And then 1 Corinthians 12 speaks of a special gift of faith that not all Christians receive. Now, the Spirit's the source of both the fruit and the gift of faith. But the fruit describes a quality that's developed over time. As a Christian matures and grows in Christ, just like a tomato plant will naturally produce tomatoes, a Christian will naturally produce certain gifts. And while the gift of the Spirit describes an intervention from outside of a Christian's own resources, just like if you were to give a gift to a friend, while everyone can and should exercise faith in God on a continued basis, the gift of faith is an extraordinary measure of faith for an individual in a specific situation. So the gift of faith is more than just belief in God. It is a supernatural impartation with extreme confidence in God's ability and his power to do a specific work in a certain situation. Now, the gift of faith can certainly occur for one's own sake, but most likely it's occurring for another person. God will enact the gift of faith in one person so that that person can get a hold of God for someone else's miracle. You're essentially being used to intercede, to make a difference in someone else's life. You're, he's allocating the gift of faith to you for a specific need at a specific time. Next is the gift of healing, which is a divine gifting, similar, allocating some sort of physical, mental, or emotional healing to someone else. Meaning, you're allocating the ability to interfere in their situation. So if they have a mental problem or they have a physical problem, God has granted you the gift of healing to intervene in that situation. Now, it's very important right off the get-go to make the statement that because you have the gift of healing, you aren't healing anyone. God is the healer. God does all of the healing. You're just being used as the conduit or the vessel for which he can work through. And how he chooses to work through someone is up to him. Because he does whatever he wants, whenever he wants, and he doesn't ask my opinion. And I have never heard anyone come to me and said, God, yeah, he, he messaged me the other day and was asking my advice. I, I've never heard that scenario happen. But perhaps one might have a gift to see God heal the blind. Another might have a gift of healing to pray for mental disorders. Now, I know we're making distinctions here within the gift of healing, but God can manifest himself in any way he wants at any time, in any direction. We don't box him in and say, you know, this is only what God does. But sometimes the healing that people receive is immediate, and sometimes it unfolds over time. 
But nonetheless, it's always nice when healing does show up. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you got to get it where you can get it. The final power gift is the working of miracles. And as previously noted, these gifts do not operate isolated from one another. The working of miracles is like the gift of healing, but it can apply to a wider spectrum of needs. The working of miracles is the gifting to see God's power manifest itself in supernatural ways that defy the laws of nature. People have prayed for cars that would not start only to see them start again. Explain that, Mr. Mechanic. People have prayed during violent, severe weather only to see it stop and calm down. There's been occurrences where an oncoming car has turned sideways and avoided an accident. These and a lot others of different situations can be the operation of the gift of working of miracles. Our God is a miracle worker. It's pretty exciting. There's no limits. Too many people put limits on God, or they at least put limits on what God will do in their life, and they should not do that. At least give them the shot. You give them the shot, yeah. Jesus likes to take the shot. Just as before, though, we are not working the miracle God is. The gift allows us to be the vessel. And then when we talk about the vocal gifts, we're talking about the, the first gift we come across is the gift of tongues. And regretfully, many in Christianity have confused with this gift with what happens when a believer is baptized with the Holy Ghost. The initial sign that someone has been born again, they have been filled with the Spirit, is the sign of speaking in tongues as the Spirit gives utterance. In Acts 2, Acts 10, Acts 19, you go down the list, everyone in the church in Corinth who heard Paul's epistle at that time spoken to him were speaking in tongues as they were born again. But the gift of tongues is a divine message proclaimed to the church in a language that's unknown to the speaker. So the speaker does not know what they're saying. They are unaware of the language they're speaking. They may be, may be familiar with the dialect or something, but they don't know what it means. Often this gift will be heard during the worship time or the altar response to a sermon and will happen during a sacred, quiet moment. Oftentimes you can feel when that's about to happen. There's some kind of shift that happens. Downshift, maybe. Everyone gets quiet. You know it's coming. Brace for it. The Lord's going to intervene, and he's going to give us a word. This should be exciting. That he's personally speaking to us. That is great. The individual exercising that gift will speak out clearly in tongues, in a manner that makes it apparent this utterance is not simply to edify only themselves, but it's to edify the body. Many times the message will be expressed by two or three different people in a row. And generally, if you notice, a lot of times the interpretation of tongues, a lot of times, has to do with the message that's being preached. It's not like they're preaching on healing or something and then a random right ball message comes out there. Normally it comes in with alignment with the message. Now, of course, God can speak however he wants, whenever he wants, say whatever he wants, but just food for thought. The gift of interpretation of tongues goes hand in hand with the gift of tongues. So this is the supernatural ability to express the meaning of the unknown language that was just spoken so the congregation can understand if someone speaks in tongues and no one understands, what profit does it do? It doesn't profit anything. But when the interpretation comes and people can understand, then it edifies the church and lifts them up. Now, the gift of interpretation is a trans... It's not a translation of the tongues, but it's an interpretation of the tongues. It's not a direct translation. It's God's using the vocabulary, the the whole essence of that person and speaking through them versus another person. So it may sound a little different, but it's still the voice of God being used through that person. And this can explain that it's not the translation of tongues, but the interpretation of tongues. This can explain why a lengthy message in tongues can have a short interpretation and why a short interpretation can have long tongues before that, because it is an interpretation. 
God's work is being communicated to the hearers in an understandable way that has been supernaturally expressed in another language. The gift of interpretation. And finally, in this category is the gift of prophecy. Prophecy can be both be both foretelling, meaning declaring something that will happen before it actually does, and it can be forthtelling, expressing the word of God directly from his spirit. Sometimes prophecy can actually accomplish alone what the gift of tongues and interpretation do together. It conveys or it communicates a message directly from God's spirit to the hearers. Prophecy can come from a bold utterance at an appropriate time in service, or it can occur even without the whole congregation realizing it. During preaching, when God's spirit directs the minister to specific words to declare to the congregation. So you think, well, no prophecy was shared here. Well, it very well could have been shared at the pulpit. Just hope you were listening for it. Hope you were paying attention. Now, this is just a general bullet point view of some of the gifts of the Spirit that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians, and Brother Scott's going to come clean us up a little bit. Stephen's back. It's nice to have him back. Had a, uh, working in a, a really cool job uh, for a short period of time, and so we're glad to have him back in the house. Uh, and there's nothing to clean up here because it feels good to me. Uh, I, I, so I want to go on in, in 1 Corinthians 12, since we were talking about the gifts. Uh, we've talked about spiritual giftings, uh, things that are supernaturally evident in someone's life. In uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 28, Paul is continuing to, uh, to list out some of the um, positions and the giftings that happen in the church. And he says there's set in the church apostles and prophets, teachers, miracles, gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversity of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? He's talking about the the fivefold ministry there are all workers of miracles. In verse 30, he says, have all gifts of healing, do all speak in tongues, do all interpret. And he's asking the question here, which are the better? And we're going to talk about that. I'm going to, I don't want to get too ahead of myself because next week we're going to talk about what the better is in this uh, sandwich of, of chapters that we have in 1 Corinthians. Many of us think about when we talk about gifts of the Spirit, we think about them being these, these power gifts or these revelatory gifts. Um, we, we think about, you know, something, you know, whoo, happening like this. Nobody thinks about the guy who's creating the processes and handling the leadership of the church. And Paul says that along with these spiritual gifts like healing, like interpretation, miracles, etc., there is also forms of assistance, which is what that word helps in the KJV means. Just like we have to have people who are in, uh, invested in the spiritual realm to move the spirit through our midst, we also have to have people who are gifted in ways of making the church as a body work. And so that's the logistics. That's the... the um, meeting the needs of our community through our church. That ability to lead is the, the KJV's version of government, whenever it talks about governments. That leadership, that, that, that desire to lead or that desire to, to invest in the physical, in the logistics, the, the, the governmental aspect of the church is just as important as having someone who is anointed to have the miraculous because you cannot have a cohesive body without having someone who is going to uh, move that body along. Do you understand what I'm saying? So it's, it's good for us to remember that if, if you say to yourself, well, I, I really feel led in a very mundane area, 
I feel like that I should really invest in this particular area of the church, whatever that looks like. And you're like, but that's not spiritual. Anything in the kingdom is spiritual. Anything that keeps the kingdom moving forward is a spiritual gifting. So you may not, you're, you're, you may not have uh, stopped a speeding car in the middle of I-70 just by speaking the name of Jesus over it. But you have done a really good job at organizing a group of people together that have then canvassed a neighborhood or you've done a really amazing work in social media and you've reached thousands of people because the Lord has led you to do that. I don't want to, I don't want to take away from either side because all of it, this is what Paul is going to talk to us about tonight, all of it is important because it's all part of the body of Christ. Amen. Now, nowhere in the scripture does the uh, manifestation of the Spirit cease whenever we get to um, the Middle Ages or whenever we cross over into the Renaissance. At no point does the, 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 the power of God suddenly the switch gets flipped and we lose everything that Paul has been talking about. And there's a, there are a, a large contingent of people who really believe in God and have faith in God and yet believe that everything that we're talking about is done. It doesn't exist. It doesn't happen. And there's nothing in Scripture that backs that up. Jesus said in Mark chapter 16, these signs will follow them that believe. All of the things that you're seeing me do, casting out devils in my name, speaking with new tongues as the Holy Spirit gives the utterance. Uh, you're, you're, you're running into a dangerous situation with a snake or, or there's a poisonous issue in your water, whatever the case may be. It's not going to hurt you and you're going to lay hands on the sick like you've seen me do and they're going to recover. That doesn't sound like to me that once you get the industrial revolution, you no longer need the miraculous. Just because King James wrote us, uh, uh, translated us a Bible into the, our, our common language, well, we don't know we no longer need the miraculous. That's not what Jesus says here at all. The, the, the supernatural is accomplished in our uh, our, our world today because people are engaged in their relationship with God, not just on the, the, uh, the head knowledge, but in their heart. I want to be connected to you, Lord, in as close a possible way as I can through your spirit working through me. Now, Corinth had a lot of problems, and, and we could, we, we're, we're in the middle of the first book of Corinthians if we start out in the, in the book of Corinthians, uh, Paul tells him, you guys got some issues, but the gifts of the Spirit is not one of them. You are, uh, you're, you're not behind the eight ball in the, the gifts of the Spirit. But the, there were some abuses that were happening, and Paul's writing them to say, this is how we need to fix some of these things. The, the believers, remember we've talked about the believers in Corinth being... Uh, just a, a raw bunch of, 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 they were sinners. They were showing up at church, but when they left, they didn't take church with them. In fact, for somebody who was a, a real party animal in the New Testament church, they called them a Corinthianizer. You, you were part of if you were in, uh, you were going to you were going to church, but you <laughs> weren't taking it home with you. We called you a Corinthianizer. We have to remember that this is not the, the gifts of the Spirit are not evidences of spiritual maturity. Okay, we tend to think about people who are full of faith or working the miraculous as being dudes in $1,000 suits with huge entourages and flying in jets, or, or they, they come in and they've, they've spent six months in a, a wholesome place fasting. 
the gifts of the Spirit are gifts. And just like you have talents and abilities that are part of your personality, God does the same thing in giving you gifts. And those giftings are very different from the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit we've been talking about comes from investing in the Word of God, investing in your walk with the Lord. You're you're exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit because you've been working on yourself to get yourself to that point, allowing the the Word and and the Spirit to minister through you. And so you're getting better at being a Christian. New converts, people who have just been baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost, can be used in the gifts of the Spirit even if they don't realize what's happening. Now, some of, sometimes that, that's, that, that messes with people's theology because we think that the, 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 the fruit is like the gifts, and that is not the case. The fruit will tell us about a person's spirituality and their character. The gifts tell us about the giver because the giver is God, and he has the design of that individual's life in mind. And so he is the one who determines whether or about that gift should be active in that individual's life, regardless of the, the life examination that we may have or the doctrine examination that we may have. This is sometimes how it is uh, confusing to people because they see someone being used in the gifts of the Spirit, and then they they pull back and they look at the, the, at the totality of the individual's life and they're like, well, how is that possible? Because the Lord decided, okay, someone needs something from, the, from me. I'm going to utilize the gift that I've given them and move that situation along regardless of what is happening in that individual's life. Now, you, I know some of you are messing with your theology, but this is the case. Look at, uh, let's look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 7. Paul says this is manifested of the Spirit. It's given to every man to profit with all. Like it, it, it's going to, it's, wherever it's going to be used, it's going to be used. Go to, to verse 11. All of these work with the one self-same Spirit, dividing to every man severally whichever uh, gift they are supposed to have as the Lord wills. For as the body is one, has many members, they're members of one body being many, are one body, so also is the, the body of Christ, the kingdom of God. For by one spirit we're all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, bond or free, regardless of what our socioeconomic level looks like, we've all been made to drink from that one spirit. So If you're a member of the body of Christ, filled with the Holy Ghost and baptized in Jesus' name, you have the ability to be used of the gifts of the Spirit. You have the ability to do that. And don't equate the use of the Spirit in your life with God's acceptance of your lifestyle. There are people who think, well, I was used of the gift of the Spirit on Sunday night. That means I can do whatever I want on Thursday. Because I did it last Thursday, last Friday, last Saturday. I showed up and God used me in church. And so, man, that's just fantastic. I can do whatever I want to during the week as long as I just show up and do what God wants me to do on Sunday. That will catch up with you. The Lord will yank your chain eventually. He won't re move the gifting but in his mercy he will discipline you you're one of the, you're all bodies part of the body of Christ he says in 27 members in particular your spiritual gifting gives you context in the body of Christ now, some of you are like, I have no idea what my gifting is. Because whenever I went through uh, next steps or discipleship class, nobody gave me a card or I didn't pull one out of the pile that said, oh, I have the gift of faith, okay. Or I have the gift of this. That is not the way it works. There are times whenever someone is given a gift and they operate for many years in that gifting. 
and become, sometimes people become uh, known as uh, this individual has a gift of healing. This person, this individual has a gift of faith. There are others who one time they show up in a situation and they are able to speak a word of healing into someone's life. The miraculous happens and it never happens again. They show up at a, at a service on the other side of the continent and they give a message in tongues. They've never given a message in tongues before. And it never happens again. That is completely up to God. He knows what that gift is best used for a season or for a moment. He knows what's best for his church. I want us to take a break for a second. We're going to go to a, a, a guy who's going to ask us some questions about giftings that are operating in our life. Jeremy Stafford, let's hear from him. Susie, go ahead. This past Christmas, all the presents were separated and everyone was ready to open their gifts. My daughter was so excited looking at all the gifts she had received. We had separated them and placed them in front of each individual that was opening them. And she leaned over and pointed, and she pointed at her biggest gift and said, I can't wait to open that gift. She thought her biggest gift was her best gift. She didn't know that maybe there was a more valuable gift that was a little bit smaller that we had put aside for her for a little bit later. In fact, she had been begging for a new watch for months. My wife and I like to put aside one of the gifts until the very end. We let the kids open up all their gifts, and after everything is open, we bring out that last gift. She thought she wasn't going to receive that new watch that she had been begging and begging and begging. She just thought the biggest gift was her best gift. Many times we categorize the gifts God gives us by what we think is the biggest and best gift to what is really least. And truly all gifts God has given are for his kingdom and they all go to further his kingdom. Maybe you wish you had that gift of miracles because that is what you think is the biggest gift. Maybe it's the gift of prophecy, but maybe God has what you deem a smaller gift over to the side just for you. And he's waiting for you to use it to further his kingdom. As you go through this lesson, why don't you maybe take an inventory of everything and all the gifts that God has given you for your life. Evaluate those and think, how am I using that for the kingdom of God? Let's determine to further his kingdom through the gifts he is giving us. Let's come alongside our brothers and their giftings and let's work together in unity to further God's kingdom. We're going to continue this concept, this, this uh, conversation over the next week on talking about gifts of the Spirit. We're going to talk about uh, uh, chapter 12, the rest of chapter 12, 13, and 14 of 1 Corinthians uh, in the next, next week. He's asking the question, where are you standing in the kingdom of God? Where are you standing in the body? And it's important for us to ask the question, where are we and who are we? Because the whole concept of the body of Christ is that it's a unified body. It's all working together. And so whenever you are used in the gift of the Spirit and nobody knows about it, it doesn't mean that you are not important to the kingdom. Whenever your spiritual gifting is used in a very public way, it doesn't mean you're better than the rest of the body. It just means that you showed up in front, whereas somebody might show up on the foot, or you showed up in the head, or you showed up as an ear, or whatever the case may be. And Paul kind of makes some jokes about this in 1 Corinthians, where he's saying, which one is better? Is it, is it all the ear, or is it all the eye, or is it we all a nose? Doesn't matter. It's all part of the same body. And so it's important for us to be looking for the good of the church, the good of the kingdom to be advanced. And whenever we're saying to the Lord, I want you to use me, I want you to use me for the betterment of the kingdom. I want to see what you have 
the, uh, what you have in store, not what uh, I want to see in my life. Some of us have trouble with being in the front, and the Lord knows that about us because he knows us. He made us. Some of us have trouble being in front because when we get in front, we want to stay in front. And the Lord knows that about us also. And so there are opportunities for us in, 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 in the kingdom to um, be sharpened, as the scripture says, and to be pruned as well. And so if your spiritual gifting conflicts with your fleshly desires, this is a good opportunity for you to examine yourself. Okay? And if you haven't seen the gift of uh, a spiritual gift happening in your life, then it's a question of where am I spiritually, okay? You need to ask yourself, have I been filled with the Holy Ghost as we talk about in the book of Acts, speaking in other tongues? If I have, and I have had that initial evidence of the infilling gift of the Holy Ghost, then how is my life? What's in my life? Do I, is there an area of my life that I need to be cleansed in? Is there an area of my life that I need to re, uh, be restored by the Lord of the Lord in my life? It's good for us to review ourselves, take inventory of yourself on a regular basis. Where am I in the catalog of God's gifts? Am I ready to be used? Am I standing by or have I taken myself off of his shelf and I put myself in the corner? I've thrown myself away where he can't use me because he evaluates us on metrics that are impossible for us to understand. He looks at us in ways that others would look at us from the fleshly side and say, this is not a useful individual. This is not a useful person. Uh, this, this individual is not going to do anything for the kingdom. And he puts things and puts us into places where he alone knows what's best for us. Susie, run that, uh, uh, that last video there. It, don't you love the as seen on TV stuff that they've got at Walmart? It's just random stuff as you walk in. And it's just like, what in the world is this? Like, who cooked this little invention up? This is a useless box. You can buy it on Amazon right now for $14.99. And it is a useless box. You flip the switch, and it reaches up and flips the switch off. Every time you flip the switch, it reaches out and flips the switch off. It is a useless box. And you keep thinking, and you'll watch this guy. He's going to try and try and try to, to keep this thing open, and the thing will just keep working its best to shut itself off. And it's a little gizmo, and it's fun, and it's a, it's a neat piece of little tech. But the point is that this box is useless. It does nothing. I want you to take this home with you. You are not a useless box. You are a box full of potential for what God wants to do in your life. And regardless of how much you think somebody's getting nothing out of me and I don't have anything to contribute. Or maybe, like the box, you're fighting against the master to shut your lid. I want you to know that you, as a child of God, have a purpose and a, a fulfillment in your life. And the body of Christ would not be effective if you weren't being used. Stand with me tonight. I want us to pray tonight that the Lord would allow us to operate in the gifts of the Spirit, that he knows what's best for us, that he's prepared for us. I want you to pray that the gifts of the Spirit would be active in our church. You, some of you have been here for a while. You know we have different gifts that are more active than others. I would love to see all the gifts of the Spirit equally active in our church because we believe that they can are, that they can be. And I want us to exercise our faith so that we would be unified together and that his gifts would flow through us as a body and through our services as a whole. Lord Jesus, I thank you for using us as part of your kingdom. 
I thank you for using us as part of your glory. Lord, we want you to get your namesake out of our lives. Lord, I thank you for filling us with your spirit. Lord, that your, your spirit lives within us and empowers us to be used to give you glory and to call attention to your name. Lord, help us to allow the gifts of the Spirit to operate in our lives. Lord, when you know we are prepared, when we are able to do so effectively, Lord, I thank you for using us for your glory. Lord, call each one of us to that place that you have prepared for us in whatever capacity it is. Lord, I thank you for using us for your glory. We submit to your authority and to your will. Lord, cleanse our spirits and our minds that we would be willing vessels of use for your kingdom. Lord, let our services, let our community, our church be unified together so that your gifts could be uh, fully functional, operate freely in our midst. We want to see you at work, Lord Jesus. Lord, we call for you to be at work in our lives. We give you the praise. We give you the glory. We give you the honor today. Thank you for working through us in Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Somebody say in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being in Bible study tonight. I so appreciate you being here. We'll see you on Sunday in Jesus' name. Don't forget, chess night on Friday night, 7 o'clock.